What's up, everybody? Welcome to season two, episode three, another edition of the Surf and Sales podcast. I'm Scott Lease here with my co-host and good friend, Richard Harris. And we are brought to you this month in January by our good friends at Gong, Vidyard, and Lead 411. So check out the, their website, check out their products, good people, and they'll really help your, uh, your sales growth this year in, in 2021. We are joined today by the legend of community, an author of Community in a Box, as well as the founder of the Enterprise Sales Forum and principal startup advocate at Amazon Web Services, based, I believe, in Singapore still, Mr. Mark Birch. How's it going, Mark? <laughs> Do well, Scott. Uh, interesting story about Singapore, just to kick things off. Uh, so I was, uh, I was rolling off a roll at Stack Overflow, helping to build out their enterprise business. Went really well. I had this vision of doing the same for, for Stack Overflow, but building out Asia Pacific. And so I spent a ton of time out in Hong Kong and Singapore, was planning on moving there. Plans changed and I ended up joining AWS. Well, this was right when COVID was about to hit. So I got on a flight end of March because wow. just the shit was off the fan happening in New York City where my family is. And as soon as I landed, it started to go haywire in Singapore and they ended up shutting down. So instead of actually being in Singapore, doing my role as a startup advocate for APJ, for AWS, uh, I am doing this role here in the suburbs of New Jersey. <laughs> so you never, you never made it then? I, I will. Um, yeah. I think it's planned to be in the next month or two. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a crazy year, I think, for a lot of, a lot of so, folks. So let, let, let's talk about this for a second. Like, it's hard enough to onboard a, a new gig, let alone onboard a new gig in 2020 during the middle of all this stuff, yeah. let alone onboard a new gig when you're supposed to be on the other side of the world. How, how do you, how do you navigate all this? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. The role as it is described is to be out there uh, advocating for all the things that AWS provides for startups in terms of, you know, both our, our services as well as the programs we provide. And so that means being out in the ecosystem, meeting up with startups and founders and CTOs, but as well as- But just for the VCs. Singapore region, but just for that part of the world or yeah, globally? Just for that part of the world. So everything from okay. you know, Korea, Japan, really everything that's in Asia outside of greater China, right? So that's what they, and it, so it goes all up and down it goes from New Zealand and Australia all the way to India and everything in between. So it's a massive region. And the role is really about being on the ground, speaking at events, uh, working with founders, collaborating internally with our business development folks, our sales teams. It, it's, it's a really interesting sale, by the way, when you're selling to really early stage startups. But uh, in any case, I'm not there on the ground. Yeah. So it is a bit of a different role. And I've been focused much more on just creating tons of content. So that was kind of the evolution of the book I wrote called Community in a Box. And a lot of the content I've been doing from like the startup founder sales series on the AWS blog. And so it's been much more just building the foundation till a point in time when I can actually be on the ground. Oh, and plus all events are virtual. So I do a lot of these speaking gigs where I'm up at 1 a.m. in the morning yeah. to do a, a meetup, for example. You're on the graveyard yeah. shift. I have a question. Do you, are you, do you have a background from APAC? Like, how did you decide to do this? Like, you know, there's, I know tons of people like, wow, if I could get a job overseas, I would love to do it, right? Did this just sort of fall in your lap? Is that how you built your career in general terms? Like, you know, and, and maybe... One, I'd love to know how you got there, but then if, if people are listening and they're like, I, I want to go try and do something overseas, but I've never done it before, where do they even start? Yeah, I, uh, I think much like you, Scott, I'm, uh, I'm like this weird jack of all trades and I've put my, my finger in lots of different uh, paint cans. So Richard, it's, it, it really started <laughs> 
crazy enough, because my background was first as a commodities trader, not in sales. I was working on the floor of the copper ring in World Trade Center number four. Wow. Then I had this vision like technology is going to just, that's where the future is. And it's going to displace every, all these traders on the floor. Like we don't have a job in 15 years. And that was 1995. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'm seeing all these internet companies. So I want to join tech. So I joined as a software programmer, like a junior software program for a tech company in New York City, moved out to San Francisco when I had an opportunity with, with the same company. And then I ended up in sales because all the reps in our West Coast territory quit. And so I was the only one who knew all the customers because I was going out there doing all the consulting and setting up the software. So like I was default, a technical person. Yeah, by default, because default. I was a technical person. Though, so I'm the only person actually both knows the product, but also knows the customers. Mm -hmm. And so I've had this like really topsy-turvy career where I just kind of saw things and I just did it. So APAC was an interesting story because I've been going out there for years anyway, because my wife is from Hong Kong. And I never really had this vision of, okay, I'm going to do business in Asia. That was never part of the plan. But then something crazy happened. I started to look at some data at Stack Overflow because we have, so just for a reference point, if no one knows what Stack Overflow is, it's the site that every developer on the planet uses to ask questions and get answers. It's a free site. It's been around for over a decade. And you talk to any developer about Stack Overflow and they're like, yeah, that's a godsend. I use it practically every day. Well, we also were developing an enterprise business. And I was using the data from what users were coming to the site to actually help develop sales and figure out what accounts to, to focus on. And what I started realizing is that there's this huge influx that's coming from Asia Pacific, particularly countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, but also a huge percentage us usage in places like Singapore and Hong Kong. I said to myself, this is a huge greenfield opportunity. So how, how would I make this happen? So on one of our family vacations, uh, I decided, let me just go to LinkedIn. I'm going to reach out randomly to 100 CTOs. If I got no meetings, forget it. But if I get something, I'm going to explore this and see what happens. Well, lo and behold, I actually got some responses over these LinkedIn requests. And I met these folks during my vacation. And I came back and I said to myself, there's, a, there's an opportunity here. We can be successful. And, and now that was the start. And I actually wrote an entire blog post. What I'm hearing is if you want it, you have to take the risk yeah, to just try. Just, gotta, just try. Like there's, there's, just like everything else we do, whether, and I don't care if you're in sales or life, like if you want something different, do a little research, figure out a right way to try and craft a message yeah. and go for it. Now, did you, did you talk to people through this process for you? Um, I don't know what happened to Scott. Did you talk to this process through two people to say, hey, if I'm gonna do this, here's how I'm gonna do it. Like, did you get some advice from people also, or were you really, are you really the guy who likes to just figure this shit out and do it? I think I'm the latter. Uh, yeah, and I've had mentors in the past, but oftentimes, the biggest leaps I've taken have been purely, I had a thought, I saw some data, I had a conversation, and something just clicked in my mind. I said, you know what, let me just try it. And I have plenty of experience, so I knew like the right types of things to say, right? So when I would send out messages to CTOs in a region where I had no connections, you know, no real knowledge of, I still knew how to say craft a, a message that would get people's attention. Right. Like I knew, I knew I had the basics, right. And I think the basics, right. have so the what basics your, down, you know, can apply with, it anywhere. With, without giving too much away, approximately what was your age at that stage? Uh, I'm in my forties. So everything I've done like starting the enterprise sales forum, for example, uh, 
launching the business, the enterprise business for Stack Overflow and doing this whole Asia Pack thing was post 40. Okay. So you had some life experience to help guide you, right? Which I think is important and, and different, you know, if, if for, for those who are earlier in their career in their 20s or 30s, you know, that may be the reason Mark didn't feel he needed to go out to his mentor and say, how do I do this, right? As opposed to someone, if I'm 20, yeah, you should go for it, but, you know, maybe you should ask someone too. So I just want to make sure that, that you know, one, I want everybody to just go for it, like, by all means, go for it. But, you know, Mark was very smart and thoughtful in his approach, right? He defined the process to Scott's addicted to the process mantra, um, and then stuck with that process, could probably tweaked it a little bit, so... Um, yeah. Absolutely, cool. Richard. But do you, do you have to craft a different type of message to, quote, get somebody's attention? So I heard you say, you know, I knew how to craft messages to get people's attention. I'm just wondering if you're trying to get my attention over here in North America versus trying to get somebody's attention over in APAC, is it thematically the same or is, is, there, is there a difference in, in how you would try to do that? Yeah, I, I kind of played the role of, I'm not selling, I'm just, I'm curious. So my message was, I'm looking to explore uh, what we can do as an as a organization to be helpful to, to developers and would really love to get your perspective on what the technology community is like and where you see as the biggest pockets of innovation. So I really just posed it as a question. It was, it was actually very similar to an approach I used for one of my, my very first tech startup when I went out on my own. So I went out to, do a, to build a company around HR workforce analytics. And this was back in 2008. But I didn't really have a lot of really great connections to HR leaders. And so I just, again, I went out on, on LinkedIn and I reached out with a question to like over a hundred HR leaders. And I said, yeah, this is kind of the, the idea I'm thinking about. Would you find this useful? Do you but have there, any insights? But is there, there is cultural differences in terms of how you approach, not just selling, but creating and forming and establishing these relationships, I would think. So when you say you just reached out to people, you make it sound super easy and casual and, and, and maybe it is um but i'm just wondering is there is there a different way to ask that question that that you would you would use on somebody in that part of the world versus you know here in here in north america or not i i used to think that but ultimately people are very much the same and what i mean by that is we like to be recognized, we like to be praised, we like to be acknowledged for who we are, and we don't like to be sold to. And so I just take that same type of formula and I hyper-personalize these, the, these outreach messages. So I try to find something which is gonna be of interest or valuable to the person I'm reaching out to. Yeah. But to the extent that culture does play a role, I do have to recognize that English is my first language. I don't speak Korean or Japanese or uh, you know, Vietnamese, it's English. And so you have to be, you have to be targeted in kind of how, you're gonna, how you believe you're gonna be most successful. And so I focused on Hong Kong and Singapore first, because I knew that I could get away with being an English speaker the predominant business languages in Singapore and Hong Kong are English, and I'd have more success. And also using those tools like LinkedIn, I knew there'd be a, a heavier percentage users usage of those platforms of the people I'd want to reach out to versus other countries where something like LinkedIn really isn't like a tool that's used very often. Not people don't really have platforms. Yeah, yeah. What do you... Just out of curiosity, if you, I got, there's so many directions I want to take this. Um, first, first, I want to come back to LinkedIn, but culturally doing business, and specifically with startups, if you think about startups in Singapore and APAC or even Hong Kong, like pick maybe one region, 
what are some of the similarities and what are the differences, right? Because we, you know, we think startup, we, we often think, you know, either people, who, you know, who are, you know, they got enough FU money to go start something new or they're young out of college and they're super brainiacs, and they're built something cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are, what are some of the nuances, I guess, of, of a startup there and a startup here? Uh, it, it is very, it is very regional. So the very first thing you need to recognize is that language matters. So if you're trying to sell in Japan and you don't speak Japanese, that's a challenge, right? So there's some just very core things you need to realize. Down upon? Like, are you looked as like the American cowboy if you try and come in too aggressive or in a certain way and you can't speak the language? Yeah, there's definitely those, those cultural, the, those, I think, cultural vibes where if you come in with a kind of prototypical American attitude and you go what into what these different that, regions. What does that look and sound like? It just, it, it sounds pushy. It sounds aggressive. It sounds like you're rushing the process, whereas things are much more relationally. Things take time more often than not in Asia because people want to build trust. They want to know that you're someone that you, they can do business with. There's also a perception that, you know, and this is not just American, it can also be European, but that you have these executives that come over and they do the executive flyby. <laughs> but they're not really committed to the region. They're not really committed to the relationship. And that's a big thing. So there's already going in, if you are an outsider selling into a region, this applies to enterprise companies, startups, whatever. There's that perception that, oh, this is just someone who doesn't really care about our culture, our community. They're just looking to make a deal. Yeah. Well, there's that that word community again. And, and one of the things that, you know, really sprouted out in a big way uh, last year was the rise of all these micro communities, Um, which I know because I follow you on Twitter, I've seen different takes that you have, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, It's one of the reasons I like following you on Twitter, actually. Um, And you wrote a book about, you know, how to to build a community. I want to know, what are the differences in, in building a community if... Uh, if you're going for like really large scale and, and, and global and just a, a catch-all, if you will, versus more targeted, more specific kind of smaller micro community, how, 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 how should somebody focus if, if they're trying to build one versus the other? Uh, I think it really starts with, uh, it starts with starting small. If you're thinking about trying to build this big global thing, it's really not going to happen. Uh, I'm also going to take a, a short break because there's someone at the door. No problem. <laughs> take a pause. Hey, it happens. We'll talk about it, Scott. So I'll I'll jump in, Scott. Just since you built a couple of communities, right? Thursday night sales, which feels bigger, um, and I don't know if you if it's global, you could tell me. Yeah. Um, but versus your Patreon, right? Which is micro community, right? Um, how do you see a difference in how you built them and, or not really? Well, the, one of the, because one you're of the, fucking uh, Scott Lee, because you're the Scott Lee. One, so one of the differences would, would be, you know, just in, uh, and how much interaction you have as, as the founding member of, of the community, like accessibility, right? So, you know, I've participated in building my own Patreon group, which is a few hundred people. I have to be, in my opinion, I have to be very accessible. I got to be super responsive, right? I got to make them feel like they're, you know, I'm on speed dial if they need me, right? Whereas, you know, a Rev Genius, which I've been an advisor to, it's near 10,000 members now. I don't have to, I don't have to get in the the weeds like that. I don't want 10,000 people blowing up my cell phone every single day. And, thir- and Thursday night sales, you know, it has a very specific, it's a community, yes, but it has a very specific like 
time box. Like it's Thursday for these particular hours. Yep. And we do have a Slack community now, but again, it's thousands of people all across the world. Like I can't be everything to everyone. And so that setting those kind of boundaries and expectations from the start, I, I think have been important to me, but we've got Mark back and Mark's the expert <laughs> on, on this community stuff now. So I'll, I'll go back to my question is like, if you're building for big scale or more micro community, like what are the differences that you're, you know, you should be shooting for? I think it needs a, you first need to consider context, right? I think for yourself or me or any of us here, you are not part of say a big brand or a company. So it behooves us to think small and targeted, right? Because if you think about the, what a community really is, it's, a community is people coming together with like interests and values. Mm -hmm. And so for your Patron group, that community, they have things that they really like. They want the accessibility. Uh, there's a ton of value that's being created. It's small and targeted. Whereas if you're a big brand, you're a, a big corporate, yeah. their perspective of community is very different. They are, they do need scale because the scale is what's gonna actually gonna create enough of the, enough of the liquidity for the community to actually catch momentum. So how, so how do they make, how are you gonna teach people to make each member of a large scale community feel special, feel valued, feel important or whatever. And by the way, I love the Freudian slip of calling my Patreon group, the Patron group, which is, which is you know, I host these things called Tequila Tuesday, so it all, it all makes sense. It was a perfect I, I didn't even think of a Patreon Patron. I was just thinking, oh, he's just you know giving you a hard time about his Tequila Tuesday. <laughs> it was hilarious. That was awesome. So guess what's on its way to you, Mark? Big. <laughs> so it's uh, see, so being special it means very different things depending on what the ethos of the community is, like what what the what the purpose and the why is behind it. So I talk about in my book, Community in a Box, that ultimately any sort of community is about solving some immediate problem. So as an example, when I started Enterprise Sales Forum, honestly, it was a way of getting a lot of founders in New York City that were building B2B tech startups to stop inviting me out to coffee uh, and basically taking up eight hours of my day just in coffee meetings on one-on-ones with founders, which I really enjoyed, but doesn't scale. So the enterprise sales forum was a way of saying, okay, I can get all these founders I know have a huge interest and a thirst for knowledge around how to do B2B sales. I could bring them into a room and invite people I know that I can trust that are gonna provide really actionable, practical advice. And we'll just do this as a, as a monthly session where we teach kind of on a particular topic in sales. What I didn't expect is that it would actually expand to the extent that it did. So my kind of, my why or my mini why was just to get, just to scale, <laughs> just to figure out something that could help these startup founders figure out B2B sales. But then it, it changed and then the why became a community that can help any salesperson. And so that's part of the, the, the first part of the question around scale is what is your community all about? And also asking a very specific question around whether it's a community or just an audience. Right? If it's people not kind of interacting with each other in a many to many type format, then it typically is more of an audience. So you know, when I think about my newsletters, like I have this one newsletter called Dev Biz Ops. It has 4,000 subscribers. It's you know, really active, some really great content, but there's not necessarily a lot of engagement. The engagement is between me and each reader as opposed to the readers themselves. Yeah, it's one-sided, yeah. Right, so it's a more of a one-sided type of community dynamic. It really is that, that building of audience, which in itself is a type of community, but it's a different dynamic. In those types of communities, you really need to make that relationships feel special, much like the, uh, I don't know if you know of a blog post called A Thousand True Fans. I don't know that one. But check it out. Anyone who's listening to it that are, is thinking about maybe building an audience around what they do. Uh, 
really great blog post by Kevin Kelly that goes into the fact that if you're an artist or a creator, if you have a thousand true fans, you can make a living because you're earning enough from people that's that the, care about what you do. That's the magic number. And it could be a thousand, it could be 500. It doesn't, like the number is not you know, necessarily as critical. Scott, Scott has a thousand and one and I have 999. And uh, Scott, right, Scott and I just had this conversation last week about goals for me. And, uh, you know, so I agree, the number doesn't matter, but, uh, you know, that's, that's how it rolls in our world. Yeah, but you need to make those people feel special, like you're giving them access. But when you're talking about a community like Rev Genius or the Enterprise Sales Forum, it's more free ranging because the value is in those interactions and the networking. And it actually builds upon this uh, concept called Metcalf's Law, whereas you add more people to the community that are interacting and engaging, you're creating tons of value. And that's how you get big, broad scale communities like things like Stack Overflow. Where it's a massive Q&A site, but it works because people are getting value from those interactions and the content that's generated. Yeah. So I got, I got a, like a ridiculous amount of questions around this community <laughs> stuff, um, as always, you know, um, and I do want to take a note that, I mean, the episode's not over, but I, I've yet to get called out by Scott for trying to talk while I'm on mute. We've gone through two and a half episodes this year and that's a record. Um, so the, so question on eliminating noise in the community, or, and for lack of a better phrase, well, not even a better phrase, just the assholes, right? The people who always are coming in and being mean, right? Um, and there's a difference between being controversial and engaging in conversation. Do you just kick them out immediately? Do you just kind of go, well, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna have to live with it for a little bit. Like what advice do you give to people around that? Uh, there, there are degrees, right? So it really depends on how egregious the, uh, the offense is. Which is why I also suggest that at some point you seriously consider having a code of conduct. So you have something that you can rely upon that gives some guardrails in terms of the types of things that are deemed inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, and some things are just that they're a, an immediate like get out right. infraction, like any, any sort of harassment, any threats. Um, and we've experienced that at the enterprise sales forum. I've thrown people out immediately. Right. Uh, but then there's just people are, are just, they're, um, they're difficult people, but they mean well. And I have a, a person that's, that I'm thinking right, right in the top of my mind. He's talking who, about you, Richard. Who's, uh, chime in and say, that must be me. Go ahead. <laughs> that's really difficult. Keeps asking these ridiculous questions. Yeah. Uh, but in their heart, they, they, they want to contribute. Right. And I think there's still value in that, but sometimes it's worth as a, as a community leader or moderator to maybe pull a person aside and say, hey, I really enjoy the, your interactions and you know, the, thing, the ways that you contribute. Uh, sometimes people may perceive uh, the way you present your really valuable insights in a way that may not be as uh, conducive to, to engage in conversation. You, know, just, you, you give people these subtle warnings along the way and see and, if they adjust. Yeah, I would, I would say too, one, that builds the value of giving them that one-on-one -on -one attention. You're not the first place they've ever had this problem, but you're probably one of the first to recognize as a leader, like this person needs some coaching advice and they could probably value that, right? And if they get offended, then, then they shouldn't be in the community. But, you know, I, I think that's that piece, right? Where it's, it becomes this coachable, teachable moment for them to say, hey, you know, you're asking good questions, but they're kind of in this forum and maybe you need to just sit back and listen for a while, right? Look at how people are, you know, so I, I love that you do that. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, at the top of that code of conduct obviously is no pitching unless specifically asked of you, not of your industry, but of you. Do you follow that in the enterprise forum? Yeah, actually the very, very early on, I had uh, four key tenants about uh, what it was that I, I thought made us unique, different, and truly made us a community. And so one of the very, I think the first one was just an open and diverse community. Right? So I wanted to encourage like, anyone, any background that you were 
welcome to, to join and participate. But one of the, the key ones was, you know, we're non-commercial. You know, we, we, value, uh, we value all sorts of advice, conversations, but we, we don't, uh, what we don't encourage is that you use this platform, this community, as a mechanism for your own uh, commercial benefit. So even when we are hosted, and all, I'd say 95% of our events, and we've had over, I think, I think about 400 plus events over the past six years that we've held globally. Only in a few instances, you know, have we had issues where uh, people were outright pitching, uh, both either as the hosts themselves that brought us in for, for free that we didn't have to pay for, or people that we invited as speakers. In fact, I think there, there was only one speaker we ever had to, um, that we had to have a conversation with about the, the content that they shared. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, the monetization comes from being associated right like like if you're gonna you're, i'm a part of, of modern sales pros right which is different than than your community because um, you haven't invited me but um you know i never pitch myself i just try to give advice right and then through that people will find you and go hey man you i, I saw you give this advice on this thread or on linkedin even um so you know that that's as the individual where you monetize when is it appropriate though so you've built this community you've had it for a couple of years mm -hmm. When and how do you think you should try to monetize it for yourself? Like, when is it fair? Because I think as the founder, sometimes we feel guilty. First, we got everybody here to be free. Now we're going to charge them, right? Or whatever it is. Like, how do you view that and recommend? For I've tried. Uh, I've tried some different things. So, all of the events were were always paid except in newer regions where we're trying to get established. So I felt I mean, that it was- If I came to an event, I had to pay 10 bucks. Like I had to go through Eventbrite or something and pay yeah. 10 bucks. And I thought that was a fair exchange of, of value. Like if you're willing to pay for the event, that shows that you are generally interested in the, in the content. And I noticed that right away that when we had free events, the drop off would be well over 50% from those that registered. Whereas people that did pay, our uh, drop-off rates were less than 15%, right? So immediately we just get a better quality of crowd, if you will. Uh, and it helps in terms of the networking and it just, it elevates the entire experience. Uh, the other thing is thinking about subscription. So both at an individual level, so people can subscribe to the enterprise sales forum for a year, uh, mostly doing that through Substack and the newsletter as the vehicle for that. But also thinking about subscriptions for companies if they want to invite their employees. So you say you buy a pack of like 10 seats for events during the year, then uh, you can invite, you can have 10 of your employees attend enterprise sales forum events for free or whatever it is, right? Well, that's customer, right? Like right. If you're, that's that's yeah, one mechanism. That's really cool. I hadn't thought of that one. The, the other ways are sponsorships, which is obvious. So I went big in the sponsorships uh, one of the years and I felt it really backfired because it, it just creates a very distorted relationship between uh, what you're able to offer and deliver and what a sponsor is expecting. You know, it's very different if, you know, it's like $500, it's you know, kind of chump change to say, hey, let's mention a name, you know, throw up a logo. When you start to get to 10, 20, 30, $50,000 sponsorships, then it gets really uncomfortable because they want names, they want leads, they want to prove ROI. And that's never what the enterprise sales forum community is ever going to be about. So, so what's a sponsorship worth for surf and sales? What are you going to pay us to be our sponsor? You know, we want to know. <laughs> if we had any money, that would be great. If you, if, you, if you sponsor us, you know, if the number's right, we could probably sort of cut your cost 
for uh, coming to the event. So, you know, you can come surfing with us for free or something. But um, anyway, I, I digress. So um, any, so the one thing I think in particularly on sponsorship, particularly today, particularly 2021 based on 2020 and to your point, sort of the maturing of the community and it's maturing quickly. The one thing I see is that every sponsor wants email addresses. Mm -hmm. yes, like yes. that's about it. And I think a challenge for the community is that as you build your community, it's so repetitive, right? You're, you know, if I get a hundred people to show up, 85 of them are going to be the same people who came last month because they you've value got, the community. You've got these loyal, these loyalists and these people right. who come in. Yeah. So oh. that, that to me becomes just another piece of the puzzle you got to figure out, but you also have to be able to turn around and sell the value of, you know, that person coming all the time and seeing your name and you connecting with them. So there's, there's different ways, but um, I know Scott's got a couple more questions and then we, we yeah. do have to sort of wrap, but I, I, I was actually going to just, I do want to interject one thing. Uh, you always have loyalists or, and that's great, right? You need that, but you also need the, you need, you need to be able to cycle through and you continue to grow and scale uh, if you're going to build a vibrant community. Otherwise it does get, it does feel old. And I actually talk about this in, the book community in a box about reinvention and re-energizing the community and always thinking about novel interesting ways if you're always doing events where you have four people on the panel yeah that gets boring after a while so you do different things maybe we do a pitch event maybe we do kind of like an hr roundtable type of talent thing yeah, there's lots of different ways of thinking about it, or maybe you adjust the content. You know, one of the best events we hosted was inviting some well-known uh, investors to speak about their perspective on sales and how they think about founders that pitch them and what they expect when they think about revenue generation. So always thinking about novelty and switching things up gets p new Faces to come and appear. It, it grabs people's attention. And so always think about doing that. You always do your yeah. core things and you do that well because you can operationalize that, but always be willing to experiment, try something different. Well, I think you just, you just nailed it for me when you said, you know, you're, you're fighting for people's attention. That, that, that's what we're doing. And, and I think it was yesterday, maybe I said, one of the best gifts you can give somebody right now is your full undivided attention because it's so fucking rare, right? It's so <laughs> yeah. hard, hard to do. And you just because you've got these people in your community, it doesn't mean that their attention is yours and yours in perpetuity. Like you got to be scrapping and clawing and trying new things all the time to keep that attention, uh, you know, and that spotlight on on you and, and what your your group is uh, is up to. So speaking of sponsors, one more shout out to uh, Lead411 and Vidyard and Gong for all the help uh, that they provide in making the show possible. Mark, before we get out of here, man, how can we be helpful to you? Is there, is there anything, uh, you know, you're working on, on the side, you want to give a little, a little plug to, you have any questions for us? What can we do yeah. for you? Yeah, I'm on this, uh, mission to, uh, just take ideas and build something that's, uh, real and actionable for folks. So this, this is going to be a stretch. I'm trying to do 52 projects in 52 weeks. Cool. So the first one that I released was LinkedIn hashtags. Very simple. It was, a hat, it was a list I created over the past few weeks that listed over a thousand hashtags that have 10,000 plus followers. So you go to LinkedIn hashtags.com, download it. There's no sign up form. It's just free for the community. See if it's valuable to folks. The one I released today is called a hundred days of sales. So I know it can be really difficult for people to get on the track to improve their sales skills. And I really do think that uh, you can have great training tools, processes, but ultimately the motivation has to come from yourself to want to change. And also to, what helps is being accountable. So the idea of a hundred days of sales is that you use a hashtag hundred days of sales and you post something that you learned and you do that for a hundred days straight. And that helps to not only encourage you to continue to learn and, and push the envelope and raise the bar on your, on your skills, but it also keeps you accountable. So uh, 
Richard, we, Richard, we've met somebody who's more fucking nuts than me in, try, in terms of how prolific they're trying oh. to be. Oh. <laughs> Mark's raising the bar. I feel like a slacker. Right. We did 200 episodes, three, you know, three and a half a, a week or whatever it was last year. And now I feel like a wolf. Yeah. Like I didn't do no, anything. no, no. This is, this is my level I, of crazy. I, I saw the 100 days of sales thing earlier, right before we got on. I didn't get a chance to check it out yet, but I, uh, I intend to. So best of, best of luck with the uh, 52 projects, Mark. Super ambitious, man. I, I look forward to seeing what the next, really cool. next, the next 50 are. are. Yeah, you got 50 to go, dude. <laughs> I didn't mention he has a full-time job, right? Yeah. And, and he's married. And he's got kids. Like, I don't know how you do it, dude. Like, how many hours of sleep are you getting? Four? <laughs> Sometimes. <Yeah. laughs> uh, well, this was a lot of fun, Mark. Appreciate you sharing your insights. Yeah. And uh, stay, stay in touch and let us know what we can do for you. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Richard.